Lou Reed has been called one of the most influential figures in rock and roll, first with his group The Velvet Underground, and then as a solo artist. His songs like Take a Walk on the Wild Side, Sweet Jane, and Heroin cover topics previously unexplored in rock music. Now, Reed is the subject of an American master special. Lou Reed, rock and roll, heart looks at his career and his influence. He also has a new live CD I'd call Perfect Night. Joining me now, the man himself, Lou Reed. Welcome. Good to see you, Charlie. Here. Um, I'm in the documentary, which pleases me. I understand you're in twice. <laughs> it goes whenever, back. whenever we had a question where we needed a smart guy, and we asked the question we really had to have answered, Charlie was there. He went back to an interview you and I did in 1979, I guess, in Paris. It was you, Charlie. <laughs> it, it was, was you, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, I could have you. been a contender, Charlie. Yeah, it was you. It was you. How do you feel about this? American masses, you think of it as, as sort of legends. You think of yourself as a legend? Not for an nth of a second. <laughs> Believe me, when, when they, in a restaurant, when they give me the bill, yeah. I don't, I don't, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, take I don't, it back, I'm a legend. I'm a legend, please. <laughs> What's wrong with you? But it is flattering to oh, have yeah. your life and, and your contribution to rock and roll, you know, encapsulated in terms of, of a whole series of interviews with other people and with footage from you and conversations with you. It is flattering. It's just, it's also very surreal. Yeah. And in terms of watching it, you feel narcissistic, put it that way. But it is, it is a flattering thing. Anything that you didn't want in? Or things that, what are you most proud about being in? I wanted and hoped that they would concentrate on music, which is what I do. The, um, things I'm proudest of from a career point of view yeah. would be writing. Really? Yeah. When I can write a really good line, or at least I think it's a good line, I get enormous pleasure from that. What do you think has been the contribution that you have made that's been most lasting just to, to rock and roll? I don't know that I've made an individual contribution. I was part of a group that I think, along with Warhol, may have had uh, given a little nudge to multimedia, perhaps, and maybe the subject matter that could be uh, written about in, in rock, although it certainly has been covered in books and uh, in, lo in other forms. What contribution did, did uh, Andy make to you? Oh, he was our uh, benefactor. He was protector, mentor, idea man. Um, no one knew who we were. They thought he was the guitar player. <laughs> Listen, right? you, think I'm, you think I'm kidding around with you, Charlie. <laughs> yes, I do. When I go to certain countries, yeah. they, they say, does Andy Warhol still play the guitar for you? Do they really? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> Hunter Wagner from Rock and Roll Animal and Warhol. Yeah. Was he the lead guitarist in the Velvet Underground? The Velvet Underground could never stay together. You guys would get it together, then you would break up, then you'd get it together again, then you'd break up. Mm, well, slow down, Charlie. You're going over a... <laughs> <laughs> Not a year, that's right. A 30-year period, <laughs> you know. I stand corrected, Mr. Reed. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, we had a nice run of it for, yeah. uh, for about four or five years. Yeah. And we went our separate ways, and right. then... You went solo then? Yeah. Yeah, to uh, not a rousing reception, I might add. You know, it's very hard to leave a group as a solo. It's because? Very, for the same reason people thought Warhol was the guitar player. They, uh, pe people don't generally have an individual person in a group that's an identified. But to finish the other thought, then a few years later, we, um, and I'm so glad we did because afterwards Sterling Morrison passed away. And we, we uh, had the fun of playing together in Europe, and that was fun. And then we wanted to stop while it was still fun, and we did. Yeah, when was that? When did you stop for the last time? That was, what, five years ago? Yeah, about 93. Yeah, I yeah. think. This is a clip from American Masters. Uh, this is a... <coughs> I'll be your mirror. This is when you and interviewees and you commenting on the way you sing and 
what he writes songs about. Take a look at this. I'll be your mirror. Reflect what you are. In case you don't know. I'll be the wind. When I think about Lou Reed, I think about the tone of his voice. His voice and the way he sings always sounds familiar, like a friend who's telling me something. The way I sing, I want you very much to feel as though someone's sitting right next to you. Very intimate, very real. You've got to believe that it's real. Let me stand, baby, to show that you are blind. Please put down your hands. Because I see you. Here was this kid grown up on Long Island, coming to the city, experiencing all this crazy stuff at a very early age. Drugs, the art world, the star machine of Warhol's factory. You can hear in his lyrics what was going on there. I'll be your mirror and you are. I'm usually writing about what's around me. It would be hard to imagine not writing about everything that was going on there. Plus, it was things that I was really interested in. said how much I would love to be able to do that and you looked at me like are you serious I mean that's to be able to stand up in front of an audience like that and connect song music in it's, that ambience I never thought of it that way Charlie <laughs> serious I, uh, playing with a band yeah or and or and playing for an audience that's that's really great fun but I I believe that anybody can do that. You know, I truly, you know, Charlie, let me take you off for 45 minutes with a guitar. I'm going to show you the same three chords yeah, that sure. I've been... The same three chords that you've been... Uh, using over and over and trying to get right. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, the, op the opening chords, I'll be your mirror. You know what this sounds like? This sounds like what Mike Nichols said to me about filmmaking once. He said, you know, I can take a week and teach you how to shoot a film it takes you a lifetime to learn how to make a movie <laughs> oh well okay there you go but if, if you wanted to have the fun yeah you know, of doing it and being part of it and you could I'm um, you know I could show you how to do that up to a point what are you performing next uh, June 5th and 6th Where? Uh, Oslo Oslo <laughs> I don't think I'll be there <laughs> <laughs> you got a big budget look at this place your expenses. And, uh, yeah. Let me just talk a, a little bit to have you talk about. I mean, you came out of Syracuse University. Yeah. Describe Lou Reed coming out of Syracuse University. What was he like? Oh man, uh, I'll tell you, and you probably won't believe this. <clears throat> I went to Syracuse. I liked it because it was very big, yeah. and it had a lot of different schools. And I'd always been writing, and I was always playing in bars in bands since right. I was 14. Right. Um, I thought I'd go into journalism. Ho, 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 ho. Yes. Okay, and be sitting where you are doing what you were doing. Yeah. I did not think I would be doing what I'm doing. And I went to journalism school and they were teaching me the uh, f first week the triangular paragraph. Right. So, you know, a little information, a little bit more information, and some up, and no opinion. They didn't want an opinion. So that was it for me in journalism school. You had opinions you wanted to express. Uh, it hadn't formalized in my mind, but obviously yeah. that kind of journalism wasn't for me. I was, if I uh, had more gumption, probably would have wanted to be in, the, in, a, in a drama school, in the drama school. As it was, I took film, and I took directing, but I never had the gumption to take acting, which is what I really wanted to do. Why not? I just didn't think I could do it. You know, I would do it in private, but I just couldn't do it. I thought I was better off as a director. I did a play by Arval, The Automobile Graveyard, and I gave myself a non-speaking role <laughs> as the director. Mm -hmm. you know, I played to my strength. When was the first big moment as a musician? Oh, 
that's interesting. The, f the first thing that was interesting, well, big moment as, an, as a musician, playing with the Velvets, this cohesiveness and writing songs and having them come to life like that. That was amazing. Mm. I mean, Charlie, seriously, I was a guy playing in bar bands. I mean, I wasn't a singer. I wasn't up front. I was way in the back. On you know, the guitar. On the guitar, playing my three or four chords. And, you know, it was like you would just play the top 20. You know, whatever, and they were all pretty much the same. And, you know, there was the lead singer, right. which was definitely not me. No. And when, uh, when we formed the Velvet Underground, I had some songs, and we would get together. And I, you know, if you wrote it, you were the one who sang it. It's kind of, I think that's the way it worked, how we ended up that way. When did we had a fight with Maureen to get her to ever sing anything. Take a walk on the wild side came along when? Wild side is in the early 70s, like yeah. 73. Produced by David Bowie? Yeah. Right. Roll tape, here's another scene from the American Masters Rock and Roll Heart, which airs on American on PBS at 10 p.m. Wednesday, April 29th. The verbal and musical zeitgeist that Lou created, the nature of his lyric writing that had been hitherto unknown in rock, I think. He gave us the environment in which to put our more theatrical vision. He, he supplied us with the street and the landscape, and we peopled it. Lou was beyond glam, if you really think about it. You know, there was... His kind of glam was like really intense. It had a serious New York after hours vibe. You realize that shot is backwards? I didn't know that, no. Yeah, if you look the way I was playing guitar, I don't I am not Henry. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, yes. Get fix back it. in the edit. Fix it. Fix it. Yeah. Um, let me talk a little bit about this, and I'll come back to the American Masters thing. This is the new CD with this fancy new guitar, right? It's not a fancy new guitar. It's called a what? Would you call no, it? No. The nickname was? Uh, no, no. That's the gadget that came along with it. Uh, I fell in love with this acoustic guitar. Right. A friend of mine said, you should talk to this guy who makes these great acoustic guitars. And I, I got one. I was in love with it, but I was in love with it amplified. Right. And... Uh, we built a, I built a show around it with the guys in the band because I was so in love with the sound. I said, I, you know, we, because I'm running it through a real amp, right. you know. And uh, that involved, uh, it started feeding back, and a friend of mine built a thing for me called a feed bucket right, so right. you can right. make the, the, the naughty feedback go away. Right. Okay. And the show was built around the, 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 this kind of electrified acoustic. And if I didn't say it was acoustic, you wouldn't probably wouldn't know. It's just a very clear, beautiful sound. These are not, this is not Lou's greatest hit, but it's songs no. that you have written over the years. Why did you do this? Why did you put these together? I was playing uh, with the other musicians, the guys in the band, Fernando and Mike and Tony, and I said, let's throw away the other set. Let's sit down and play this way. What, what do you guys think? Our songs that would work. And we would play and play and play and say, ah, let's try this one or try this one. Sometimes we would try one and it didn't work. And then other times it would gain or it would certainly have another point of view, another way of getting closer to people with it. I thought it focused it, made things clearer. It was really, really interesting. I love that guitar and I love that sound. And that's what that album is all about. What do you think of rock and roll today? Where it's at? You know, I get I get asked that all the time, Charles. <laughs> no, and uh, I'm actually, I'm I'm giving a class in this. Really, where is rock and roll? <laughs> where has it been? Where is it going? And yeah. why? Where are you, you teaching know? this? That's I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> at the new school. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody says yeah, that. Of course yeah, they do. yeah, at midnight at the new school yeah, in front of the do. library. Yeah. I. Where is it? I mean, are you happy with where it is? Is it is it? I'm not, interesting to you. I'm not a critic. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not s saying that, like, to you in a negative way. What I mean is 
I listen on the radio like other people do. Um, I hear things I like and other things that are so-so. What do you, when they watch the, this documentary <laughs> on April 29th at 10 p.m. on PBS, what do you want to, what do you hope they come away with? Oh, you know, I've wondered about that along with why I even did it. Yeah. You know, That's it's even like, a better question. But yeah, me, well, if you did it, what do you want anybody to <laughs> yeah, get out exactly. of it? Uh, I, I was hoping for myself that it would bring the music in front of people a bit and uh, maybe they'd be intrigued by it, yeah. want to hear some more of it or, you know, there's a line from one of my shows where I say, I do Lou Reed better than anybody, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and once in a while, I'm listening on the radio, and I'll hear something, and it sounds like me. Somebody doing Lou Reed. And doing him pretty well, yeah. you know. And I thought, well, you know, Timothy uh, Greenfield Sanders is a, is a... Producer and director of this little film. It's a friend of mine. He, he had brought this up, and I'd been asked to do this many times over my distinguished career. Yeah. But... Uh, I'd always said no. I thought it was uh, just a little too narcissistic. Um, After all, you've I, already been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As a member of a group. As a member of the group, right. All right. As a member of the Velvet Underground. And uh, I wish Sterling had been here, yeah. if I may say that. Um, but as far as what people come away with something, you know, as long as they don't come away with poison ivy or something. No, but come it's on, you're proud pretty, of something. I mean, you've got benign, a body of work that you've done. Story. You've recorded a lot of songs. Yeah. You've written a lot of music. You've been around a lot of years. You've known a lot of people. Almost as long as you. Yeah, almost. We're about the same age, actually. Yeah. Uh, you, you were born in what year? 42. Uh, I was, so was I. We were both born in 42. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but you've done all this kind of stuff, and you wanted to stand for something. Yes? I mean, you you got I some like pride about what you've done with L Lou Reed. More than pride. What? Yeah. Honor. what? Honor. Honor of purity. The honor of purity. That's also the pursuit of writing a great line. You know, I try and try and try. I'll go back to the thing that was said to you about making a film. There's a way of playing a D chord. Yeah. And I've gotten better at it. And the, there's something about doing it correctly and hearing the melody and hearing, I mean, when you put simple words together, you can generate a great deal of emotion. And that's what I'm proud of, trying to do with it. Simple. On a one-on-one -on -one basis, I always thought my music was made in some ways for headphones. You're on headphones, you're mine. One on one, simple words creating deep emotions. Yeah. With grace. Well said, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's a little rude. We'll go out on one more clip from this film. Uh, and I remind you American Masters, 10 p.m., Wednesday, over April 29th. Here is the last clip. Lou Reed. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Lou's very open to atmospheres. He's got his eyes open. He knows what's happening around him. Cutting all the social services, cutting back on food for kids, and essentially attacking the weakest segments of the population. It's real inhumanity to man. And New York is the first one to show the result of all that. And to see it, all you have to do is walk outside. Pedro lives down at a wheelchair hotel. He looks out a window and doesn't have any glass. All the walls are made of cardboard. He's got newspapers in his shoes on his feet. The old man is going to beat him because he's got no time to beg. He's got nine brothers and sisters. They're brought up on their knees. It's hard to run when a coat hanger hits you on the thigh. By the way, the, the, um, the New York album, when I first heard that, it blew me away. And it was a huge turning point for Lou and his career. Get it out.